Hi gang, I'm George Johnson. And I'm James Fever. And today we're in Thessaloniki, Greece to test out the new Nikon Z8. So we've just left the town that we were sleeping in and we've got here quite early. We're here at Lake Kikini, which is famous for kind of quite a wide variety of wildlife. The most famous, I suppose, would be the Dalmatian pelicans. So we've got a few already that we can see. So let's hop on the boat and see what else we can see here. So we've just got off the boat, and I must say, I was actually really impressed with the Z8. Now, what I really liked about this camera was the customization when it comes to the frames per second. So you can shoot up to 20 frames a second when shooting in JPEG plus RAW, but if you want to shoot slightly faster, full resolution, you can shoot up to 30 frames a second when it comes to JPEG. But if you want even faster, which this camera can do, you can shoot up to 120 frames a second in 11 megapixels. It really depends on what you're photographing. If you're photographing something incredibly fast, like a bird taking off in flight, 30 frames per second is more than enough. But what I found, 20 frames a second, to be honest with you, is plenty for such a wide variety of different photography. So let's go off to our next adventure. So the Nikon Z8 has a whopping 45.7 megapixel full frame stacked CMOS sensor. Now there are many benefits to a stacked sensor over a traditional non-stacked sensor. The main two is firstly readout, so it reads 280 times faster than a traditional non-stacked sensor. That will help with rolling shutter issues both in photography and also video, but it also has a faster autofocus, which is really important, especially if you're doing anything action related, like we're going to try some wildlife, that's going to really help to make sure you're getting absolute sharp images. Now, 45 megapixels, or 45.7, is a real high amount of resolution. You're gonna be able to crop in a decent amount. So that's great for landscape work or wildlife work. Yeah, we've got 400 mil, but I'll be able to crop in twice, getting us roughly an 800 mil crop, while still having a decent amount, around 25 megapixels. So that's gonna be really helping quite a variety of diff different situations, both when it comes to photography, and obviously it also shoots 8K resolution in video, but that's something George will chat on in a bit. Now something else to mention about the Nikon Z8 and also the Z9 is it has a full electronic shutter. So there is no mechanical shutter in this camera. Now that has two major benefits. Firstly, it has blackout free viewing. So if an object is moving left to right, sometimes you'll see a, you know, a black screen come down. That's the actual mechanical shutter coming down, basically obscuring you from what you're looking at. But because this has no shutter, that will allow you to see it constantly. So it's got blackout free, which is really handy to keep an eye on your composition throughout your tracking or moving subjects. The other thing is it can shoot really fast. So traditionally a, a, you know, a mechanical shutter can shoot around 8,000th of a second. Now that's really helpful in some situations, but incredibly bright sunlight, not so great. This will allow you to shoot 32,000th of a second, which is crazy. But you can also shoot really long as well. So instead of shooting really fast, you can shoot around 900 seconds, which is 15 minutes. And that's without having any cords or any remote shutters, which I think is really nice. It does it in camera. So if you're doing any astro work or if you're doing any long exposure work, you can do all of that in camera without buying any additional accessories. So we're literally just on this farm track and incredibly lucky a farmer was just walking past with probably about two, 300 water buffalo. Now we've just spoken to them, they're just about to head into the water about a kilometre further up. We're obviously with a tour guide, Hello Thessaloniki. 
we're able to get quite close to the animals, but obviously please do beware, if you are going out taking photos of wildlife, you need to make sure that you're staying a good distance away. They had a few babies with them, and of course, you know, the, we've got some mothers there as well, so you do need to be careful, don't get in between them. You need to stay a good distance away, which is why obviously a 400 mil is excellent for this type of wildlife. You can stay nice and safe while still getting the shot that you're after. Right, so that was a really cool experience, watching the water buffalo kind of head into Lake Kikini. They're on a, a small little island now. So let's quickly talk about how well the kind of camera operated when it came to kind of the autofocus, because we've done a variety of different kind of situations now. We've done a little bit of landscape, we've also done some birds, and then now obviously we've headed, we're put into more of a difficult, more challenging situation trying with the water buffalo, mostly because of how many buffalo were in the shot. So the Z8 does 493 autofocus points, and that's across the entire sensor. So you can select single point or wide, you can be really customizable. But what I really like about it is the subject detection, so what it looks for within the shot. So obviously it does the classic ones, so it does humans, so it does eyes, head and torso, but it also does animals, birds, planes, bikes, cars, all sorts really, and you can all select that within the menu system. Now with the water buffalo we just did, because there's so many in shot, it was a very challenging environment. I was really low down to the ground, create that nice kind of foreground and background blur, using the water to kind of really bring up the water buffalo. I really want to get them kind of splashing into the water. And because of that, it's a very shallow depth of field. And also there's lots of water buffalo in the shot. So the camera didn't quite know which one I wanted to photograph or which one I wanted in focus. And in that specific challenging environment, most cameras would struggle and this camera was really, really good. So we've waited until dusk to really test this camera's ISO or low light performance. Now Nikon say it has an ISO range of 64 all the way up to 102,400. But the question I've got is, you know, numbers are great, but how well does it perform actually in a real world environment? Hi gang, so it is the second day of our trip and we've just woken up so I might be looking a little dry eyed but we're in Thessaloniki and we just come to this nice little castle just to get a couple bits of b-roll but we're actually not really going to stay here long because there's some incredible locations around the area so we're going to hop in the car and go check them out now. Probably the most impressive spec video wise is the fact that the Z8 can really cater itself to the scale of your production. So let's say you're doing really high production stuff. You need really, really good footage files that you can have a huge amount of control over. Well, it's got that covered because it can shoot in NRAW, which is 12 bits. So obviously that's got a crazy amount of color depth. Or if you don't want to use NRAW, it also has ProRes RAW, which is also 12 bits. If you don't want that, because you're not always going to want that kind of control, you almost don't really need it all of the time, then there's lots of 10-bit options there too. So you can record in regular ProRes and 10-bit, so that's not ProRes RAW, that's just regular ProRes, or you can record in H.265. But that actually might be even too much data for some people as well. If you have maybe a really fast workflow where you have really quick turnarounds, 
you don't want all of that color control, you want smaller footage files, then you can also shoot in H.264, which will then output at 8-bit. I think this is amazing because it just means no matter who you are, the Z8 has a video compression that's probably going to work really well for you. But you're probably wondering, well, what frame rates and resolutions am I gonna get when I'm recording in these formats? And that's what I'm gonna tell you about right now. So probably the headline spec in terms of resolution and frame rates is the fact that this camera can shoot 8K. That means that of course you could crop in, so if you want to crop to 4K that's going to give you about a two times crop factor. So if you want to highlight a particular detail of your shot, or if you just want to sort of do a digital zoom or something like that, you're doing it without losing resolution in 4K. Or of course even if you just want to downscale it to 4K, it's going to provide a better look. Now, not only can it shoot 8K, but it can actually do 8K slow-mo, so that's up to 60p. So that's two times slow-mo, so basically means that you can film in 8K and slow your image down, which is just incredible. I mean, in terms of a body like this, I would never expect such a mammoth video spec, so I think that's awesome. But of course, we don't always want to shoot in 8K. It can be a little bit unnecessary for a lot of people's workflow. So you can also film in 4K. That 4K can be filmed up to 120p, which is four times slow motion for anybody who doesn't know. So you can highlight a particular moment and just really slow it down and give it the time it needs. Of course, it can also shoot 4K up to 60 and 4K up to 30 as well. So you know, you've still got your two times slow mo and your real time. Now you're probably wondering also like how long can this camera record for? And when it's in 8K, it can record up to 90 minutes. Of course, you're going to have to worry about your card filling up because if you're trying to shoot 8K for 90 minutes, you need one hell of a card. But the fact that it can do it is fantastic. And when it comes to just standard 4K, 4K up to 30p, it can record completely unlimited, which is just really nice. That means that if anybody's picking this up and wanting to use it for their creative projects, but then also wants to retain the ability to film things like long form content, such as conferences, it's able to do that. It basically means, as I said, much like with all of the different bit depths, the scale of resolutions and the fact that they all have really long record times just means this camera is really flexible. But of course, when you've got all these pro video features, something that's incredibly important is to have the correct monitoring tools to make sure you're capturing good images. So firstly, it's got a red record ring around the edge of the screen so you know when you're recording. They also have some more general monitoring options for your exposure. So you've got things like having a waveform, which is a really nice way of checking that your highlights aren't blown out. You've also got things like focus peaking and zebras. So focus peaking, just so anybody that doesn't know, is when you're on manual focus, it just can highlight sort of the area of the screen that's in focus just to make sure that your image is sharp because it's hard to tell on these smaller screens. And of course, if you don't know what zebras are, it basically means that if there's a part that's overexposed, so let's say I'm exposing for this waterfall behind me, but I've blown it out a little bit, the zebras will basically do that for you and they create a stripe over the part that's overexposed on the image so you know you can bring down your settings. This is fantastic because if you're a pro videographer, you're used to using these features every day and they are absolutely essential in a camera like this. So it's great that we've got them. So something I'm just noticing, and I've been noticing a lot while I've been playing with this camera, is the quality of the image stabilization. Like, I've been shooting handheld a lot, and I've never been quite sure when I'm shooting handheld and you get a new camera how well it's gonna perform. But on the back of the screen, all of the sort of like little motions I'm doing look really smooth. And that's as a result of the fact that there's five stops of image stabilization within the body. And then actually you can get an additional stop if you're using a lens that has optical stabilization. So then it will basically pair the stabilization that's in the sensor and in the body with the optical stabilization in the lens to give you that additional stop, which is gonna give total six stops of stabilization, which is just fantastic for handheld shooting. It means that you don't need to worry so much about using a gimbal all the time if you're gonna do quick shots.
One of the really nice things about the Z8 is the fact that it has the N-Log color profile. Now, N-Log is Nikon's log format. For anybody that doesn't know what log is, it basically produces an incredibly flat image, which you then color post-process yourself just to make sure the colors look exactly how you want them. But you're not always going to want that. Sometimes you want an image that looks nicer straight out of camera. And that also can be provided by the Z8 too. So firstly, you've got sort of the standard color profile. Here's a shot of it just so you can see it. And you have HLG, which stands for High Log Gamma, which will perform better when you're pairing it with a monitor that is basically set up to work within those colors. It also has a large amount of dynamic range coming in at 14 plus stops. So it's perfect for when you're filming in contrasting environments. So I'm really happy with that. Pretty much all of the test footage you've seen in this video has been shot in N-Log and then graded by myself. So let me know what you think of the colors, how do the colors look, and also how does it handle that dynamic range? Because we have shot in quite a few contrasty environments, some that could be tricky for certain cameras to handle. So let us know what you think, whether you think there's any problems or whether you think it looks really good. So we are pretty much finished in Greece, which is a real shame because I've had such a nice time testing out the Z8, seeing some incredible wildlife and some amazing landscapes, so I'll be very sad to be going home. But before we do, we haven't really touched on the body yet, so we'll just tell you a little bit of information about that. So firstly, it's way smaller than the D850, which is sort of the predecessor to this camera. So it's way lighter, it actually comes in 910 grams. But don't worry, you can actually still use the same batteries as the D850s. So if you're a previous user of the D850, you can still retain all of those batteries. You don't have to spend a ton of money on it. And also, if you've ever used the D850, you know how nice the battery is in that. It lasts a really long time. Yeah, no, I think the battery was really, really good. Now, one thing to consider is its card formats. It has changed from the D850, so it still accepts XQD as well as SD cards, but it now has compatibility for CF Express Type B. Absolutely, but that's not the only thing that they've updated with the body. Firstly, and one of the really cool things, is the fact that when you take the lens off, there's actually a, I'm not sure what it's called, but it's a shutter. Yeah, know? it's like a shutter protector. So basically, because it doesn't have a mechanical shutter, it will come down to prevent dust from appearing onto the sensor, which I think is a really nice feature. So in terms of ports, it's got quite a lot going on. First and foremost, it's got a full-size HDMI, which is amazing for video shooters. It means if you want to be plugging in external monitors, it's just really good to have that top of the range input. In terms of other inputs, it has an aux in, so obviously you can use that to record microphones that have auxes. It doesn't have an XLR input, but actually Tascam make an XLR adapter, so if you want to be utilizing all of that 24-bit audio, then you can always plug in the Tascam adapter, and then you can plug in your more professional microphones, which is fantastic. And then, of course, it has a headphone jack because you need to be able to listen to what you're recording. And it also has not one, but two USB Type-C ports. Now, one is for data transfer. So let's say you don't want to necessarily use a card reader, for example. And then the other USB-C is designed for power output. So you can charge via the camera, as well as it does come with a power brick in the box. Now, that's not the only thing that has been updated from the D850. One of them is the screen. And it's a bit of an interesting issue because I quite like the new screen, but George doesn't. So it is a tilting screen instead of an articulating screen. So it tilts both horizontally and vertically. Yeah, so I mean, while that is really nice for photographers, for video people, in my opinion, it's not that good because I like to have the flexibility of being able to pull that screen out and turn it any which way I want. But also, one of the main reasons I really don't like this type of screen is because there's no protection. When you have an articulating screen, of course, when you flip it back out and you then put your camera in your camera bag, there is no, none of the screen is actually facing the outside of the camera, which then means that if it bashes around in your camera bag, there's going to be no damage to the screen. But this one doesn't offer that. The screen is always exposed, which means that if you're somebody who's going to be dropping your camera or putting it in particularly harsh environments, there is a risk that there's going to be scratches and over time they can build up and become quite unappealing. But let's just be a bit more general now. We'll just tell you about how we think the camera's performed. So from a video perspective, I mean, obviously, the, I think the main appeal for me is that flexibility with your color depth. Being able to shoot 12, 10, and 8-bit is awesome. Being able to shoot 8, 6, and 4K is also awesome. 
I'm not going to be using those features that much. I'll probably stick to 4K 10-bit. That's mostly what I've shot with this because we have a fast turnaround on the review. But just the fact that it retains that option. There was a shot earlier where I was filming the Flamingos where I really utilized that 8K. I like being given options and I feel like that's what Nikon have done for me here. Now, one thing I absolutely love about this camera is the resolution. I find 45 megapixels as a photographer is that real nice sweet spot. There's a lot of other cameras out there that have that roughly the same resolution. It's a really nice, you can crop into your photos, but the photos themselves aren't that large. So they're not gonna take up much room on your SD card or even on your computer. So you might be thinking, how much are Nikon asking for for all of these amazing specs? Well, actually, they're asking for, I think it's a pretty good deal. Coming in at £3,999, which granted you is quite an expensive camera, but you think what it can do, 8K 16, things that I've never heard of, of a camera of this price range, I really think is a great deal, especially if you're in the Nikon ecosystem already. Now, who do we think this camera is designed for? Well, I think, Personally, it's designed for Nikon D850 users. If you've owned one previously or just love that camera and you want a mirrorless version with amazing specs, then this is definitely the camera for you. But unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, as so does our time in Greece. We've got to get a really early flight tomorrow morning so we better rest up. So I'll just leave you with the fact that I've been George Johnson. I've been James, and we're here for Wex Photo Video, and we'll catch you guys next time.